Hello and welcome to The Last Word on Spurs. We hope you're keeping very, very safe and well. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another edition of a transfer special. So much going on this summer. So much going on right now with Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Thank you so much for joining us. Expecting another brilliant, brilliant show in store. Delighted to have alongside me. Listen, it's transfer times. You know, that only means we're bringing back this man. We've got the wonderful Jamie Brown over at the Daily Hotspur. Jay, been a while. Here we go, my friend. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. I'm really looking forward to being back. And of course, I was about to come on and say, I think we've been a bit starved of transfer news recently. But I mean, look, I, I don't think you can really complain with with the start the Spurs have made to the window. Of course, Perisic, I think it's an amazing signing. Basuma coming out of nowhere, a brilliant one. Obviously, filled the homegrown quota with, with Forster coming in. And um, yeah, I mean, it's starting to pick up a little bit now with obviously links to Richarlison um, and of course, a number of other players. So yeah, again, it's a bit of an exciting time. And uh I think we've got a fantastic guest on to kind of uh, review it all. Absolutely. Now, this man needs no real introduction. He's been recording, well, pretty much as always, all season. He's been covering every single Spurs game. He's been there. He's done it. He's gone through it like us, of course. So we're delighted to bring the man who comes through from the view from the lane. Football cliches, The Athletic. Got a book coming out as well. We've got the magnificent Charlie Eccleshare from The Athletic joining us. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us on a crazy time right now to be a Spurs fan. How are you, firstly? I'm very well, yeah. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. We know it's all a bit crazy and chaotic right now, so thanks so much for taking the time out. And uh, fair to say, Spurs Twitter is going absolutely insane at the moment as we're recording live right here. And, you know, I think the window is just starting to hot up. Even though Spurs have signed three players, even though we're at the end of June and Spurs are on the verge, hopefully, of making a fourth, I think there's only one place really to start, Charlie, and that's, of course, with some of the... well momentum gaining now towards potentially Spurs' fourth signing of the summer in Everton forward Richarlison. We've seen, well, some some anticipation in the next, well, last few hours that Spurs, it appears, are getting closer towards a deal with Everton purely on the basis of that due to their FFP deadline they've got to meet. Spurs may be getting Richarlison very soon. What can you tell us on the latest of that move? Yeah, so nothing's done yet, but it's moving in the right direction and there is increasing confidence um, that they're going to get this done. I'm I'm pretty confident myself, so confident, in fact, that I've done the thing I'm always really wary of doing and I've started to write an article about Richarlison in anticipation that they sign him. I've been burnt with that before, so that that I, I don't do that lightly. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to happen and I think it'll be a really, really great signing. Um, as I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss kind of our views on that. Um, but yeah, I think that's going to get done. And then all of a sudden, as you say, we're not even in July yet. And Spurs have made four signings, three of whom, you know, could, are going to be pushing for start regular starting places. So I think it's, it's been a, a really, really encouraging start to the window, even though it started so explosively that then we had a quiet couple of weeks, relatively speaking, and everyone got a bit twitchy. But uh, yeah, I think things are moving again. Just another one on Richarlison. Um, of course, tomorrow, I think, is the deadline for FFP for this year. Do you think that that will be something that really speeds this deal up and maybe we see tomorrow or uh, that, that this deal kind of, you know, is at a really advanced stage or, you know, is yeah, that... Uh, th- this, has been, this has become a really big talking point. It's funny, like, I uh, someone mentioned this to me about the July 1st deadline a few weeks ago and it wasn't something I thought too much about. And then, you know, once you hear something, you then see it and hear it mentioned everywhere. It's become this big preoccupation. Talk to different people and they'll tell you different things about how um, kind of draconian the punishments could be for Everton. I mean, they've made big losses in the previous three years. I think it's more than 100 million in each of the three losses. And obviously, there's been some dispensation for that from the Premier League because of COVID and what have you. So there's been, yeah, there's been some understanding. But I do think they in an ideal world, we'll get it done this financial year to balance those books. Um, And as I understand it, and I've seen, and others have written this as well, there is a way in which they can do, they can kind of make an agreement without it all being finalized and it can still count um, in in the financial year that we're in, obviously running from July the 1st of last year until tomorrow, June 30th. Um, It could make a difference. I, I have been told as well that Everton really don't want to be kind of backed into a corner over it. So they're, you know, there's an extent to which there will have to be an understanding of that. I think, you know, cl- clubs, it's always dangerous when clubs become aware of how much you need to sell and clubs are aware. You know, they basically needed to sell Richarlison or Calvert-Lewin this summer. And obviously Calvert-Lewin, I think because he had an injury hit season last season, people have really given that swerve. So Richarlison's the one. 
And uh, yeah, I think it is going to be Spurs that they're going to be really pushing to get it done. And, and it's, a, it, it's great for them to get it done quickly as well. Because I think Everton, they obviously wouldn't want it to drag on too long. But I think we're not for this FFP thing. They might be thinking, let's give it a week or two. Let's see if another team wants to come in. They're getting a bit of a bidding war. But if, if they are serious about getting it done before July the 1st, then that option's closed off to them, which is good news for Spurs because they're not going to get you know, done by a Chelsea or whoever coming in. Yeah, I mean, I say it just feels like at the moment, you know, we mentioned it, Charlie, Spurs on the verge of a fourth signing in June. I think it just shows you anything about where the club is going right now, the positivity around the place and essentially um, riding the crest of the wave. What I'm intrigued to ask you, Charlie, about Richarlison, and I'm also conscious that a deal isn't done until it's done, especially with Tottenham. And we know, obviously, with Spurs in the past, with hijackings, that whilst I want to be very excited and uh, scream to the roof, as Jamie tweeted, Jogo Benito, you know, I, I'm also conscious that, you know, it can still have, you know, moments where it could go wrong. But um, obviously, Richardson offers you the option of not only being a loan forward as an alternative to Harry Kane. Um, he also offers you the opportunity to play in and around that front three. Just how key is that, do you reckon, to Spurs' search for the forward and what Richardson brings? Because I think when you look at the profile Spurs have signed before, they've tried to go for maybe an in-and-out striker, the likes of a Carlos Vinicius, a Vincent Janssen. This is suddenly a bit of a different approach from Tottenham and one that maybe fits the mould better for what they're looking for. Do you agree? Yeah, 100%. I think it's a really elegant solution to a problem that Spurs have had for, you know, as long as we can remember, what, getting in that second striker because, you know, this perennial issue of well, who wants to come in and play second fiddle. So, the thing I've always thought is getting in someone like Son, I mean, obviously not his ability, that's going to be almost impossible, but someone who can play out wide or can play through the middle. So Richarlison feels like such a good solution because he can do that. We know he can play as a striker, but he can also play with Kane uh, in the wide areas. And I think he's going to get a lot of game time because, you know, I think for so long we've, and this is something Jose Mourinho touched upon actually when he was at Tottenham, we've tended to kind of feel uncomfortable if, if there are really good players on the bench. You know, you know, we think, oh, God, you know, that's, that's kind of a bad thing. Whereas that's a prerequisite to success, to winning titles, things like that. You know, Man City, Chelsea, Liverpool, they don't worry about having really good players on the bench. They think that's what you should have. So I think, you know, a few people have said to me, oh, you know, do Spurs really need Richarlison? And I guess need... Well, no, they've got three really good forwards. Maybe their need is greater elsewhere. But depends what their aims are. Yeah, if they want to sort of pootle along and be in that battle for fourth, then maybe not. But if they want to step up, they want to be competitive at the top end of the league and the Champions League, you need that depth. And, you know, it's a constricted season this year. The World Cup's going to make it mad. Five subs is huge. They're in the Champions League. And so to give you an example, there's a cluster of six games uh, in the space of... I think it's about 18, 19 days. It's got, you've got West Ham away. Uh, you've got Leicester at home, City away and Fulham at home. And in that time, you've got two Champions League games, you know, one of which will be away, could be long distance, could be against a really big team. You've got one at home. That's six really big games. And I reckon in that time, Kane, Kane might need to not start all of them. Son won't, Kudusevsky won't. That's already three games you can get Richarlison starting and he can come off the bench and the others. So I think he's going to get a lot of game time. and. I think it's it's such a statement to sign to strengthen a position of strength, and and it's something we've seen so rarely from Spurs because when you think of the biggest signings over the last few years, and some of these names will seem ludicrous because of how it worked out, but at the time, you know, and Dombele, huge amount of money spent on him, Lacelso, but that was basically to offset the fact that Dembele had just gone and that Ericsson was going to go. Then last summer, Romero came in for what will ultimately be big money. But that was because Alderweireld had gone and Vertonghen had gone the year before. It's very, very rare. I can barely think of any time where you've seen Spurs strengthening a position of strength like this. So I, I think it's a really important signing and one that tells us kind of how serious Conte and those backing him are about Spurs pushing on this season and not just getting in that sort of dogfight for fourth. I, I think the other thing as well is in terms of how you mentioned there about how many games we've got. I think the idea of having a you know a set front three is you know we've got to get that out of our heads because yeah. as you said, there's going to be so many matches. So you know although on paper those three Kulusevski, Kane, and Son seem the best fit, you know Richarlison he's going to we're going to need him and certainly lots of rotation. Um, just just two more questions on Richarlison. I was going to ask. Do we know kind of what the fee is for for Richarlison and kind of what they're discussing? And the other the other thing I wanted to say because I know. It certainly winds me up a lot in terms of 
Do you think he was the first choice option? Because I know a lot of people, are, or Arsenal fans certainly, are linking us with Jesus and saying that we missed out on him. And of course, uh, you know, Rafinha as well. Do, do you think that maybe he was the first choice or was he, you know, one of the, on that list of targets? Well, I, 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 the sense I always got about Gabriel Jesus was that he was someone that was being considered and someone that Spurs liked. But he's more of a kind of striker or central player, first and foremost, who can also play wide. Whereas I think Richarlison is maybe more the other way around. Um, and I know Richarlison is someone they've liked for a while. I mean, look, the, the way we know the way Paratici operates. He, he's not just ever going to have one target. He's got a few. And Rafinha and Jesus were players they've looked at and that they liked. But Richarlison's always been someone um, that they really wanted to get. And so, yeah, I, I, I certainly don't think it's a case of they couldn't get others so went after him. He's he, he's a really important target for them. On the fee, yeah, I mean, as ever with these transfers, it slightly depends on who you speak to. And I think even when it's announced, that often happens. You know, the selling club might say one thing, the buying club uh, might suggest something else. Uh, I think it'll be somewhere in the region of 50, 60 million. Um, you know, he's got two years left on his contract. Um, and, you know, Jesus went for 45, despite only, or is going to go for 45, despite only having one year left on his contract. And I think that um, that well, slightly they, skewed things. They also paid, what did they pay for him? Th 30 million pounds anyway? So, you know. The you Everton did. did. Yeah, in, in nor north of that, I think. Um, so, yeah, they want to get, a, they want to get, decent money back for him they've also got a um Watford uh, don't they have a Watford will get 10 percent or something as well so they'll, yeah. they'll get a big fee for that yeah they? they've got a set they've got a sell-on clause in there yeah well listen very exciting we will wait for the announcement <laughs> as we do with Spurs transfers that is this kind of nature very calmly I'm sure yeah we'll try Charlie we'll most certainly try um there we've got so carried away by the the, the potential of a Spurs' fourth signing that uh my mistake, we've not even brought in a sponsor tonight. So, as always, we're delighted to be sponsored by the Beaver Town uh, Corner Pin. That's the Beaver Town Bang opposite the South Stand. And no doubt we've got some great content coming your way across the summer into pre season. Of course, they've got the big screens down there in the beer garden. They'll be, of course, hosting once again next season all the home win aways, the cities. The Liverpools, the Chelsea's, the Arsenal's will be looking forward to being there. They've got an exclusive special right now for you, lovely bunch. If you head over to beavertown.co.uk or .com and use that code TOP4, that's all one word, all caps, you can bag yourself 15% off all beer on their website for a limited time. Terms and conditions apply, and that will also be on the YouTube description link. Right, Charlie, conscious of time. We've done 15 minutes on Richarlison. I've got about 100 <laughs> names to go, not to scare you off. Um, <laughs> Wanted to ask your thoughts. Of course, Spurs have actually enjoyed a really busy summer transfer window so far. Um, obviously, Antonio Conte leading Spurs into the Champions League, back into the Champions League, and already flexing their muscles with the signs of Ivan Pedersic, Eve Basuma, and Fraser Forster as a backup to Hugo Lloris. And um, before the impending Richarlison deal that looks like it's going to be coming before us, what have you made of Spurs' business so far of this window? Uh. Forster, I think, is just a really good, solid backup keeper. I don't, I don't think you can get many much better than him, especially that homegrown. So I think that just felt like a really sensible one to do. Uh, coming in without a fee as well is great. Perisic is an interesting one. Um, you know, with, with that not under Conte, I might be a little bit sceptical of signing someone that age uh, and paying him that much. Uh, I know he was a free as well, but uh, his wages, I mean. But the sense I have is that he's still super fit and has worked with Conte before. And I think him and Sessegnon, assuming that it's Regulon who moves, though that's still up in the air, I think that's quite a nice combination. And, and I quite like the idea of Sess and Perisic sort of sharing the minutes at left wing back. And I think they, they both offer something uh, a little bit different. And then Basuma, I think, is an unbelievably good signing. I mean, he, he's someone who, whenever I see him, I'm just blown away by how good he is. And you'll remember the game in April, which Brighton won, and he was absolutely amazing, as he was in February um, in the FA Cup game. But in that April one, I was sat next to my Brighton colleague, Andy Naylor, and I was just saying to him, like, every time I see this guy, he's he's absolutely amazing. Like, you yeah. know, what, what's the deal here? Like, am I, is it just because I only see Brighton against good teams and he only shows up in the big games? And, and Andy said, you know, to be fair, this season, he has been pretty consistent. And I think that was an issue he had before, but Graham Potter really worked with him on that. Um, so he's always someone I thought, whoever of the big teams gets him, that's going to be one heck of a buy. And obviously the fact he only had a year left on his contract and the fee 
25 million for someone, you know, or you know, a, a little north of that with add-ons and all of that. But in that ballpark, I think that's an amazing buy. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited. You know, and again, what we were saying about yep. Richarlison making it, the, having the competition for places, you look at it now and Spurs are going to have him, Benton Core, Skip and Hoybier. Th- that, those are four really good options. And again, you can kind of mix and match. And we're, gonna, we're probably going to see Hoybier, you know, not playing every week. He's only missed two Premier League games since joining the club. So, yeah, I think one thing we might have to get used to at Spurs this season is players who haven't really done a lot wrong suddenly not playing a whole lot or, or at least not starting every game, you know, having to, you know, be on the bench from time to time. Um, but, but, yeah, as I say, that's kind of how it should be. Yeah. yeah. I must just say, just on, on Basuma, obviously some new stats come out um, from the Daily Mail, which is obviously confirmed from their perspective that he has been cleared of a sexual assault allegation made against him last October. Um, again, probably that's as much as we're going to get on it. And it's not something we want to go into here on right. Last Word on Spurs. So just an update on that, which I know was a lot of people wanted to, some clarification on that. It appears we've got some form of clarification. So, JR, I'll pass over to you. Yeah. Of course, we also had the exciting news, I think, a month ago or so of Enoch putting £150 million of their own money into the club. Of course, I think a week ago or so, we saw... You know, roughly around that hundred million pounds has already been drawn out of that. Um, so obviously, a very clear intention that Enoch are going to go and back um, Antonio Conte this this summer, especially as you mentioned earlier about Richarlison. Uh, you know, that's not really usually a deal that we usually go and do. So you know, real good signs that we're going to go and back Conte. So just in terms of the key positions that they'll look to strengthen, where, where else after we maybe we've got Richarlison in? Do you think they'll look next? Yeah. So the others, the big ones, are right wing back um, and left centre back. Um, those, those are the kind of two, um, yeah. Because by then, you know, assuming this all goes through, you'll have the central midfielder come in, the left wing back, the forward, and the goalkeeper. Yeah, those, those are the two ones. I mean, that would make it six. There might be room for one other. You know, obviously, Ericsson was someone they looked at. Um, you know, could, could, I don't think it would necessarily be him, but could they go for somewhere in that kind of position? I get the sense if someone popped up, um, they might do that. So yeah, but but those are the two priorities: right wing back and left centre back. And yeah, I mean, right wing back. I still I still think Jed Spence will eventually get done. Um, I've had slight Triore flashbacks because uh, I thought you know that one. Everything I was being told in January was that will get done eventually, and I did pull the trigger on that and started speaking to people for a big piece on Triore that is still sitting gathering dust somewhere. So yeah, des- I'll forever be desperate for Spurs to sign him so that piece can see the light of day. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think Jed Spence is still, you know, if I had to make a make a guess on who the right wing back will be, that would be my educated guess based on what I've been told. And then, uh, yeah, and then the left centre back. But le- the left centre back is is tricky, um, you know. And there are people they looked at last summer who they couldn't get. Uh, and 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 you know, the decision they'll have to make is that they're in quite a good position, I think, there because Ben Davis has been so good. They don't need to rush into this. It's not a, it's not a problem position, but they do need another body because Ben Davis is basically the only player in the squad who can play that role which is kind of crazy because, you know, everywhere else there's, there's good depth and, you, you know, you need two players. So they need to bring in someone. And that's where the long lay possibility comes in. You know, do they, rather than go for someone super expensive if they can't get him, do they get someone like long lay in as a bit of a stopgap for this season on a loan or something like that and then next year land one of their top, top targets? So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Okay, superb. What we will just do, we will go for our first break of the show for our listeners that are on audio. For our watching audience on YouTube, there's nearly over a thousand of you watching us live. So thank you so much for your incredible support on an evening where we are seeing Spurs very close to making their fourth signing of the summer. And uh, to quote Jamie, we may be going Joga Bonito, but we may wait and see for that just because it's Spurs and because being Spurs, we know what it can happen, what can entail. So we shall wait to see. Um, Charlie, steering the show back to you. And um, One of your recent articles, you talked about um, the incoming signing or should I say appointment of Greta Steinson. I hope I pronounced that right. Who will begin a newly created role, which will seem effectively report into managing director of football, Fabio Paratigi. Um, we understand, you correct me if I'm wrong, I think he's due to start on July the 1st. He comes to Spurs with a very good reputation. You wrote extensively about it in one of your most recent pieces. Can you say a little bit more about him and how you feel this will change the structure within the football club? 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, Steinson, because I think like most um, people who, you know, follow this sort of thing closely, my reaction was a little bit, oh, they're appointing someone from Everton's recruitment team to a senior recruitment position. That's a bit odd, given that Everton have been a bit of a basket case over the last few years. So I was kind of, I was instantly curious. And so putting together this piece spoke to loads of people who've worked with him um, at his various different clubs, you know, mainly Everton and Fleetwood as well, where he was before. And, and even beyond that, you know, people in the game who, you know, every, everyone knows each other. And his reputation is really, really good. Um, and I think the sense generally is that Everton was a very, very difficult club um, to have that sort of role in, you know, lots of competing interests, lots of politics. And generally, he did a pretty sound job. Um, and the impression I get from everyone you speak to who knows him is that he's straight talking, doesn't take any crap, just tells it as it is. Um, and I think, you know, he's a workaholic, which will, you know, sit well with Paratici, um, who he's going to report into. And he's going to have a really wide ranging brief, you know, helping out obviously with the first team but also with with the academy sides and that sort of thing. He's big on data analytics, sports science, those elements. So this is all part of, you know, and there are other people joining as well, Andy Scalding um, coming in, Simon Davis, all three of those starting soon. Uh, Yeah, Scalding and Steinson start on Friday, because that's July the 1st, isn't it? Um, And it's all part, you know, I I think, you know, what happened was Bratigy came in, uh, almost exactly a year ago. I think his start, her official starting date was July the 1st last year, though he'd obviously kind of been in place before. And he wanted to kind of have a look and see what was working, what wasn't. And now having been there a year, he's in a better position to say, okay, well, this is working, but I want to do things a little bit more like this. Um, so yeah, he's kind of bringing in a few more people that he knows uh, and that have been recommended to him. And yeah, as, as Dean writes there, Gianni Vio, who we reported today, is uh, someone they're looking at and hope to bring in, this kind of set-piece guru. So it is, it is all starting to take shape. Um, and, you know, Can like with you, anything... Charlie? Yeah, Can go for it. Are we taking Kane off those free kicks? <laughs> yeah, I know, I did, I did see that. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, as you said, with those 4,000 or, 4, or so techniques, I'm hoping that technique yeah. number one is do not let Harry Kane take one. I know, I, I saw that. That that was how most people's reaction to that article. Was, yeah. I'll tell exactly. you number two, give him the song, will you, for God's sake? Yeah, well, especially Son's been banging in a few, hasn't he, uh, during the international break. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, all of these things are hopefully just kind of giving Spurs a bit of an edge. Um, you know, we've seen that, you know, Liverpool hired a throw in coach, and I think a lot of people scoffed at that. But, you know, set pieces are so important. And Spurs were, I think they were the. I think only six teams scored fewer from set pieces last season than Tottenham, you know, and and get and you know who were top Liverpool and Man City. So, yep. it, it, you know, we we kind of think of set pieces as kind of a bit agricultural, but they're really not. And conceding, you know, Spurs had that horrible run; they kept conceding from set pieces. So, at both ends, I think that is quite an important area for them to look at. Mm, absolutely, how about you, Jamie? Yeah, of course, you mentioned there about that piece that you broke this morning. Obviously, a really interesting read as well. I think it was James Horncastle, obviously, on The Athletic, wrote that really interesting piece, kind of detailing about, you know, all, all the stuff about, um, was it Gianni uh, Vio? Vio, it? yeah, I think Vio. Okay, I'm, I definitely haven't had a long enough chance to try and pronounce that. But, yeah, I mean, again, do you think it's another good sign that they're going to really try and back in? Because another thing I, I think I remember from the summer when we tried to get Conte originally is that, you know, there was an issue with maybe getting in his staff, but now, you know, it just seems to be fully, fully trying to back him now. So again, is this another really good indication? I think so. And and I should say as well, I mean, I've reported this before, but his staff are really, really popular at the club. Like they've really um, ingratiated themselves. I think people have found them like a breath of fresh air, especially coming from, you know, Nuno was pretty introverted. I think his staff were as well. There was a pretty cold vibe. Um, and Mourinho... I think the sense was that there were a lot of them were too inexperienced, and actually, mm. and it's quite an interesting counterfactual that if Mourinho had had slightly more effective staff or guys who'd known how to balance him out a bit more, he could have been a bit more successful. I think the problem was a lot of them sort of tried to be Mourinho lights, mm. um, and actually, what Pochettino did really well, for instance, was he had staff who could kind of balance him out. So if he if he wasn't in the best of moods 
others could sort of be like, okay, you leave them alone, you you come to me, kind of thing. Whereas that yep. didn't really happen under Mourinho. I think Conte, Conte is different. I mean, like his staff, they know if they've had a bad result or things like that. We need, you know, there's no time for levity. There's no time for laughing. And Conte himself even said that he was like, the the players need to get into the mindset where you lose a game and it's it should really really hurt you. Um, but yeah, I think he because his staff have been so good. There's a trust now that if Conte wants to bring in a set piece coach who he trusts, we back him. We trust that this guy's going to be good. Um, so it's yeah, I think it's all the, the the more sort of success Conte has, the more freedom and leeway he'll have to make these kind of decisions. Okay, Jay, let's stick with you. Yeah, uh, of course there there has been another link. Of course, another player from Everton as well in in uh, Anthony Gordon. Of course, a guy who's been a you know an impressive young player this season. Certainly had a real breakout year uh, last year. Um, is, is that a player that possibly Spurs are looking at? And uh, obviously, again, from a lot of it, what's been reported as well, it doesn't really seem like um, you know a, it doesn't really seem like a guy Everton want to let go. So, is, is there any chance that this deal might happen? I think that's going to be a lot harder to do. Spurs do like him and, you know, they've made inquiries on him. He is like, he's the guy at Everton coming through, the youngster who they're sort of pinning their hopes on. That's exactly the kind of player that Lampard and the guys around him want to build a team around. Um, So it would take a massive, massive offer from Spurs. And I'm just not sure they want him enough to do that just yet. Um, so, and, and also I think Everton, they, as I said, they need to make that one big sale, but they'll, they'll do that in Richarlison. I don't think they'll then need to sell Gordon. Um, but he is, he is a player, I suppose, like, and, and I think he's a really interesting player, um, someone who could potentially play as a right wing back for Tottenham. I, I love the idea of that. I think he could do really well there. But I think, um, yeah, I expect, I expect Everton to resist on that one. But, you know, it's, it's another one. Maybe we'll see where we are in a year's time. Uh, but also, you know, it reflects they're having a lot of conversations, <laughs> Everton and Spurs. You know, there are so many players who are being talked about going one way or the other. Um, and Gordon is one of them. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't see that one happening. But, you know, th- these things can change. And, and maybe, yeah, if, if, if Everton need to make another sale. But this, the suggestion is at the moment they won't need to make that one. And they're, they're very much saying this ain't happening. Yeah. Do you, do you think with Gordon, it's kind of a case that Spurs maybe are pushing for this one just purely because he is homegrown? Uh, but maybe there are players that they do like more than Gordon, but just the fact that he is homegrown. Of course, we know Spurs maybe do will have some issues with homegrown. Do you think that's a, that's why they may be really... Uh, I'd see that more as a sort of additional extra and a bonus rather than a driving force. Um, you're right. that That is an issue that they need to address. The, the kind of fulfilling that homegrown quota um but I, I think fundamentally with him they just they just think he's a real talent and kind of fits that profile of getting the balance because it's interesting you know the signings Conte he's made generally you've got some more experienced guys alongside some of the younger ones I think that's sort of what he's looking to do whereas before he came in it was all Paratici was all about bringing in some of the younger guys. So it's interesting that that's changed. You know, Conte's obviously said, nah, that's not happening. I need some, I need some experienced heads as well. You, you mentioned already, Charlie, the fact that, you know, Everton and Spurs, there might be seemingly business to be done between both clubs. Um, again, we've seen Harry Winks being linked with a move in the opposite direction, but also reports to happen. Don Belay, Jack Clark, Matt Doherty, Stephen Bergwijn, Lucas Moura and Joe Roden have also been <laughs> apparently mentioned. It feels, God, it's like a... It's yeah. like supermarket sweep we were talking yeah. about here. I mean, do you see Spurs doing that amount of business with Everton or do you think it's limited down to potentially Winks going there? We've actually heard tonight as well some reports that Leeds have also expressed an interest in Winks. So what do you think the future does hold for Winks in general? Yeah, Winks is... I, I have uh, heard that Leeds thing uh, before um, that, they, that they've held an interest. So it's possible that will come back. Yeah, I mean, I think... It, at this point of those links, Winks and Bergvine are the ones I've heard directly. Bergvine in a Everton an interested kind of way, and they've made that known to Spurs. Winks, again, there's interest there. And the impression I've been given is that a loan with an obligation could end up suiting all parties. Everton don't want to spend much this summer as much as they can avoid it. So that would avoid that would mean they don't have to do it in this financial year. 
but also Spurs want to make a sale. Um, so, and they would, then it would mean they've got that to come a year down the line, which would sort of be fine. So I think that could be quite an elegant solution for everyone. Those other names, nothing far along as far as I know. And I suspect there's an element to which loads of names have been meant. You know, when you're in negotiations, you're yep. going to, names are going to come up. How far along they are, you know, that's uh, yep. that's going to vary. I mean, I'd, I would be fascinated to see how Ndombele <laughs> did at another Premier League club. Um, but he, he's maybe a topic for another day. I'll be fascinated if they can do a seven in one there. I mean, that's that's quite unbelievable. <laughs> we do seven players for one. I mean, yeah. that's nothing against Winx's value at all, but that is one thing I, I'm amazing. Spur, only Spurs could have a, have a report like that, seven in one. But what we will do is we will just go for our next break of the show uh, for our listeners and audio, for our watching on YouTube. We're well over a thousand of you plus watching us live. So thank you ever so much for all of your incredible support. I'm going to hand back round to. Oh, transfer guru on last one on Spurs, Jamie Brown. Over to you, Jamie. There's quite an, quite an interesting uh, comment in the chat from James, just on the Everton. I think it's just on the uh, Everton thing. I mean, obviously, is there any chance of, of Delhi? You know, of course, we saw Delhi Ali move there in the opposite direction in January. Do you think there's any chance that maybe Spurs, um, you know, kind of drop that with, with, with the Richarlison deal? Or, or, yeah. Yeah, that is. I mean, it's an interesting little. Um quirk in all of this that they're again again sort of continuing this theme of how much sort of dialogue the two clubs have had and how much trading there's been because yeah obviously there was Delhi in January and that is something that I've heard has been mentioned as a kind of extra um bargaining chip I suppose I mean that's almost like an add-on or kind of the opposite of an you know kind of oh you know we'll we'll write that off so I think that is a possibility and maybe yeah maybe that gives um Spurs a bit more leverage in these deals, yeah. but again, whether whether that's enough to convince them on Gordon, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I mean, Delhi again, a topic for another day. But I don't know if that affects how some Spurs players might view going to Everton, because I think we, uh, you know, many people thought that might be you know a place to revitalise his career, and that hasn't really yeah. happened. Um, but but it is but it is an interesting kind of additional angle to all of this. Okay, interesting. Now, another name that's obviously been, you know, kind of really going on for a, for a long time now. I think we were linked with him in January. I think even under Jose Mourinho, I remember um, there were some links to him as well, and that's Jed Spence. It's one, obviously, that really seems to be dragging on. Um, and there's also been reports of, of Daniel Levy being involved in still. So I wonder if you, you maybe heard of anything of that and, and maybe that's why the deal is dragging on a bit. But is this one you kind of expect to, to eventually get done, Jed Spence, I suppose? I do think it will get done eventually. Um, and it's probably worth remembering as well that although it seems like it's gone on for ages, we are still only in late June. And he was away with uh, the England under-21s and then was on holiday. So I think all that's delayed it. Um, I think that it's, he, he wants to go to Spurs. So... That puts Tottenham in quite a strong position because I I think like I feel like they're less fearful that someone's going to come in and scupper that deal. He wants it to be done. Spurs want it to be done. I think middle you know Middlesbrough want to make the sale. They just want to make sure that they do get you know what they feel is an appropriate fee for him. So there's always that element of brinkmanship in these deals. Uh, but I still I I do still think that one's going to happen. And you know even they have a little bit of wiggle room, not loads of time, but. Conte wants these people in the building by the time they go to Korea. They go to Korea on Saturday week, so that's what ten days from now. Um, I, 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 I am, I am confident on that one. But like most people following Tottenham, if that drags on much longer, I might start getting a little twitchy. But not, I'm not, I'm not too worried just yet. Just to re- sorry. No, go on. I'm just going to ask on: Are there alternatives lined up? Do you think will Spurs move on? Uh, there are. I mean, like, like I say, Paratici always has those. Um, alter- you know, he he never just goes all in on one player. But that is that that is very much the one that they want. Um, and I think in, until they suffer a major setback, or you know, I, th- I think they feel in control of that deal. You know, they they know roughly what it's going to take. Um, and until they feel it's really hit a snag, I don't, I don't think they're going to pursue others too strongly. I think one that was quite an interesting one, I think the uh, the, the comment um, that was on screen, Ricky, just had up about realistic right-backs. I thought the interesting one was Jonathan Klaus from, uh, I think it's Lens, had a mm. really good year for them. And I think he just got into the French national team as well. I think 
I think it was Sky Sports that were reporting potentially Spurs were looking at him, and I think there were also reports of him being available for ten million pounds. That that would be an interesting one. I'm just answering that question, I thought that Jonathan Klaus was, was maybe a good interest in Shelton. Appreciate yeah. it, Jake. Yeah, one to watch. Right, Charlie. Moving on to the uh, to the to the left side centre back position that has had about a foul. Anyone that's played left side feels like it's been linked with this role. Now it's going <laughs> down to probably non-professional footballers that we're trying to get to the point of how many names have been linked. So, um, just as well, I thought they'd say a summary because we'll be here for the next forty-five minutes. But uh, just a flavour of some of the names: we had Piero Hinchapi, Evan Dika, Alessandro Bastoni, Clement Longley, uh, Paul Torres, Rosco Gavardiel. Do you have a personal feeling, Charlie, based on what you hear in the media, where you feel Spurs may edge towards? Do you feel it will be one of those names on that list or is there somebody else <laughs> as a surprise that may come out of the blue for this position? I mean, it could be a surprise because like, we, you know, we, we reported a lot of those names back in, I think it was March. You know, this, this, is, this is not, you know, they, they've been very clear that this is a position they really want to try and improve. And, you know, on that list at that time was Guardiol, was Bastoni, um, was Torres, uh, Botman, but obviously he's gone to Newcastle. Like, th- those are the guys who they're really interested in. And, you know, e- even someone like Bastoni, I wouldn't completely rule that out. Um, you know, we- we've had a lot... I-, I know his agent has come out and said, oh, no, he loves Inter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But m- players have done that before and then moved. And, it- and you know, partly as a way, they don't want to make it seem like they're agitating for a move and that sort of thing. So I, I still think, like, I- maybe I'm you know, hearing what I want to hear, but I I wouldn't I don't think that deal's totally dead, someone at Bastoni. Guardiol, I fear might be a little bit too expensive. Um mm-hmm. Pal Torres, that was someone Spurs wanted last summer and they couldn't they couldn't get it done. Obviously they're in a much stronger position now in the Champions League as opposed to the Conference League and they've got Conte, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um but it is still, you know, it is still Th- those are still the names that you hear when you speak to people about the Spurs left centre back search. But you know, as we saw with Basuma, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Lee. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Maybe we need, at some point we need to let go, but I don't. That point. Is <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe Paratu will pull a rabbit out of the hat, uh, like he did a little bit with Basuma. You know, that was one that you know even us who are kind of speaking to people every day about these matters were, were a little bit caught by surprise on. Mm. Just yeah. one name, Jay. I know you're going to ask. Um, feel yeah, free, Jay. You'll go straight off this. Uh, only because we've had Ali on here, and I know you're, you're close friends with Ali as well from a working perspective, um, Charlie. He has mentioned on a couple of these videos, um, is it Zabani? I don't know if Jay, you can help me with that. Ukrainian. Um, is it a, a Ukrainian defender? Yeah. Zabani? I, I can't I, remember so much about him. Is that him. a name that you've heard, Charlie? One that Spurs been linked with at all? I've not heard that loads directly, um, which is not to say that he's not being considered. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's not one who's come up with conversations I've had with contacts in the same, in the same, at the same frequency of someone like Vardiol or Bastoni or, or even Pau Torres. Mm. A really weird one, of, uh, certainly from Spain, I think over the last couple of days, has been Clement Longley. In Spain, the reports have been going really hard on, you know, there's a gr- deal that's really close to being agreed. Is, is that your understanding at all that, you know, this is a guy that, or is it, or is it literally just a case of Spurs are lining up a number of different targets? Longley is one of those targets, but yeah, because in the Spanish reports and a lot of them, they're going yeah. really hard that there's an agreement. And, and from some reputable places as well, you know. So, so this was, you know, because I, um, yeah, my, the, what I've always been told on on Longley is that he's an option, but he is more of a backup. Uh, if because he'd be alone most likely, so you know he's if they can't get some of their big targets. And then I know the report stepped up uh, in Spain today and yesterday, so I checked that out. And yeah, what I've been told is that still broadly remains the case. Yes, he is someone Spurs are looking at and someone they like. And I think if they wanted to do that, that wouldn't be the hardest deal to do. Um, but I don't think it's as as close as. As, what, as what's being reported there. That may be coming more from the Barcelona end, um, you know, which would make sense. Yeah. But, but from my understanding, Spurs, he's, he's, he's a consideration and he's in that discussion, but they're not kind of mm. right about to press the button on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, th- I think that'd be a really interesting one, long leg, because of course he's had a very difficult time at Barcelona. But I think mm. it was 2018 they paid a massive fee for him, and obviously, you know, considered to be one of the top uh, young defenders in Europe. So you know whether. You know, of course, we've seen players come and work under content drastically improved, and of course, maybe working in back three. So, I know a lot of people are kind of looking at that one in long lane and maybe a bit put off, but um, I, I think that'd be an interesting one, especially as you mentioned, if he does come in as, as potential backup. So, yeah, obviously, we'll, we'll see on that one. But uh, just, just in terms of outgoings, obviously, two names, um, two wing back names that have been linked with moves away Sergio Regulon is one, um, and the other, obviously, being Emerson Royale as well. I mean, there's been talk about potentially moving to Atletico Madrid. And even actually, strangely today, I think his agent came out and said that he's definitely not leaving. Um, mm. So that, that was quite an interesting one because there has, again, there's been lots of reports that a move to Atletico Madrid. So kind of with those two players, what is, what's your understanding in terms of where they're at? I, I take that those comments again with a, a little bit with a pinch of salt um, because I think if and when Spence arrives, Spurs aren't going to yeah. want to have three right wing backs. Um, and... So that would mean Doherty or Royale is going to go. Royale has much more sell-on value. Um, you know, I, I can't see... You know, Doherty's 30 already. Can't see them getting much of a fee for him, whereas I think they could for Royale. One thing I would say, and I've, I've said this a lot, is that I think we do underestimate kind of how much clubs abroad are struggling financially. You know, it's, re- it's really hard to make the kind of sales that clubs like Tottenham want to make. So someone like Emerson Royale, yes, they'd be able to get a fee for him. I don't know how big that would be from someone like Atletico. Atletico, um, But he's far more likely to leave, I think, than Matt Doherty. Um, and then it's just about finding, finding a buyer. But, you know, it could be, and I hope it isn't, but it could be something like a loan with an option or that sort of thing because it's just so hard for, especially the wages a lot of these players are on, it's very hard to find... Um, buyers in in um in Sp- even in spain you know and certainly then in france um and other leagues then on regulon i mean he is he is one of the few people probably in the spurs squad who spurs could get reasonable money for who they don't really want anymore you know he's he's not someone there you know he's not in a kind of indombole the celso category where they're like really want to get rid of him but i think they would like to make that sale because they can bring in some cash for him and he's just, I think he's going to be, he, at the moment, he's their third choice left wing back. And it's a shame because when they signed him, I, was, I thought he was going to be brilliant. And, you know, remember those first few games, his debut against Chelsea. I was like, this guy's so exciting. He's what they've been missing. Um, I think it just hasn't quite worked out for him. I, I think he, you know, people I speak to, their sense is that he kind of tries to do things at a million miles an hour and sometimes just needs to take a touch. Him and Sessignon are kind of the opposite. Sometimes you want Sessignon to be a bit more sort of, Kind of go on, go and go and run at them, um, and and regular on the other way around. You sometimes want to be say to him, like, just get your foot on the ball, take a breath. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think regular and Royale would be ones they'd hope to sell and, and hope to get some money for. Okay, interesting. Thank you so much for that, Charlie. Um, there has been, you know, some some reports that we've seen out there in the last few weeks. There's been reported interest from Monaco in Davison Sanchez, and also we've seen. Forrest being with Joe Roden, potentially because of the link, obviously Cooper there being the manager. Obviously, they would be reunited from their time at Swansea. Um, both those players, do you think they're available for sale? What do you think? They're both in the category of um, Conte likes them, has no issue with them, thinks you know, think they've got the right attitude. But if the right offer came in, um, they, they would let them go. I mean, Roden's an interesting one. Conte really likes his attitude and thinks, you know, there, there's a good player there. Um, but it's hard for him. You know, he's kind of that second choice middle centre-back, which Eric Dyer just has that position on lock. So Roden hasn't really played much. Um, he really wants to be playing. He needs to be playing. Like He's played so little in the last two years. He's got a World Cup coming up. I wonder, and this is something that's been suggested to me, is if a loan could be a possibility because I think he's still got three years left on his contract so he could do a loan and still have a couple of years left um but and I was having a conversation with some about this with someone the other day and they're saying is a Premier League club has he played enough for a Premier League club to sign him as a first choice centre-back um you know and and I, I think he's definitely good enough to do that it's just whether um a Premier League club 
is willing to take that risk because center backs are always uh, and you know I've spoken to many coaches about this and agents they'll tell you that center backs they're the hardest to get a chance as a young player because you know if you make a mistake as a center back it's catastrophic whereas if you're a fullback or a wing or whatever you can kind of get away with that a little bit more so it's hard as a young center back to get those chances you need somewhat a manager who will take that punt a little bit and, and maybe Steve Cooper's the guy because he knows him um so that's one that would make sense to me and I I, I just hope he does get a move because I just don't think he's, he's gonna he's gonna really play enough at Spurs and then Sanchez yeah I mean like I say if they got a good offer but he's he's fine you know he, he's you know he saw at the end of last season he came in and put in some really solid performances yeah, pretty, we don't want really him to be first choice I think yep. I think that's fair to say but yeah like he came in the North London derby everyone was petrified before when Romero was out and actually Sanchez was was very good um so to me and I think their view as well is if you do sell him you need to replace him and actually he's no trouble you know he's not someone who's saying to the manager like you've got to be picking me he's got a really good attitude he just comes in and does his job when required so I don't think they really need to move him on unless someone comes in with something and they're like oh yeah that's just that would be a really nice amount of money that we can reinvest but again I'm I'm just skeptical anyone's really going to do that okay absolutely fine thank you so much Charlie for that update but what we'll do very quickly is we'll just go for our final break of the show for our listeners that are on audio, for our watching audience that are on YouTube, uh, there's only 1,300 of you plus watching us live on this transfer window update with a brilliant Charlie Eccleshare from The Athletic. You can catch Charlie, of course, on The View from the Lane, Football Clichés. He's got a great book coming out in September. Charlie, have I missed anything out at all? I think that's enough, yeah. Don't want to be here all night. <laughs> and of course, I'm joined with a brilliant Jamie Brown from The Daily Hotspur, keeping you inundated with all the latest Tottenham Hotspur transfer news. Now, there's been some comments. And the Athletic, and my, of course, if you didn't know. And, and the Athletic. And how can we forget the Athletic? Make sure you go and subscribe my, to the Athletic. My, my actual job. <laughs> <laughs> but all the latest Tottenham Hotspur news. We had some great pieces in there recently from Charlie. One, of course, about, um, again, the name Greta Steinson. Have I got that right? That's the one, yeah. He's the man yeah. coming in. Again, it's changing that structure at Spurs. You can read more about that in one of Charlie's latest pieces. And I'm sure he's got a piece of Richardson winging its way to us very soon. If... Fingers crossed Spurs do that, get that deal over the line, which will be our fourth summer signing. And just to kind of conclude on some of the comments here, um, why am I dressed as Ollie put man? Uh, this is the latest Tottenham Hotspur training kit I'm absolutely delighted to have on from Gatia. Um, they are the official training wear partner of Tottenham Hotspur and are giving fans the chance to win a signed training shirt from their brand new 2022-23 range, which as you can see, luminous yellow. You'll be seeing wherever you go. Wear this if you're cycling. Wear this wherever you go. If you want to go to the gym and want to be spotted. Um, you can also, as well as that, have match tickets to the first game of the season. All you need to do is download the app, spend £20 or more, and select the signed training match tickets promo at checkout, and you've got the opportunity to go and win that. I'm sure there'll be many queuing up for this lovely yellow bright shirt. Be seen wherever you want to be. And I'll hand back over to Jamie Brown, who's going to discuss some of the midfielders that we're trying to potentially offload this summer. Over to you, Jay. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we saw a couple of players head out on loan in, in January, and those were uh, Ndombele, Lo Celso, and Brian Hill. Are those players that maybe, you know, won't be part of the manager's plans again? Because, of course, they were moved on, in, in, as I mentioned, in January. So, kind of, what, what are the latest on those three players? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be very surprised to see either Ndombele or Lo Celso play for Conte. Um, yeah. You know, he has made that pretty clear, and, you know, loaning them out was a pretty big statement. Yeah. Brian Hill... Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine he'll be loaned out again this season. I don't, I, I, I just don't think Conte thinks he's ready. And, and Conte pretty much, again, pretty much said that. You know, he, he basically called out Paratici for that signing in a press conference by saying we've got to be more careful about the guys we bring in. They need to be Premier League ready because the Premier League is so physical, it's so demanding, it's like a different sport, was, was what he said. Uh, and yeah, we've brought in guys who, who aren't and, you know, yeah. firmly pointing at Brian Hill, which is, you know, again, like Regulon, I, I thought Hill would, was a really exciting signing and, and maybe he'll prove to be one. I mean, he's, of those three, he still has a chance at Spurs. I wouldn't, I wouldn't write him off. But Ndombele and the Celso, not while Conte is manager. And again, like I was saying before, it's just about getting, finding a place for them. I mean, I, I slightly feel with Ndombele, he's got a contract till 2025. Um, you know, he's on a lot of money He's under no. There's no reason for him to go because no one's going to pay him those wages. Mm. So it wouldn't surprise me if he's just loaned 
year after year, which is a really bleak situation for everyone. But mm. that's on Spurs. I mean, they you know no yeah. one forced them to give him a six year contract on huge wages when they did. So yeah, I, I feel like that's probably or that's possibly what's going to happen with him. But Celso is slightly different, obviously, because he went on loan to Villarreal and did really well. They really like him. But this ties back to what I was saying before about the lack of money uh, right. that a lot of these clubs have. You know, Villarreal reached the Champions League semi-final. A lot of the deals they were doing were loans, loans with options, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, hopefully, though, they will find the cash for him or someone in Spain will. Because, I mean, they, but, but Spurs are accepting that they're... they're they're going to have to make big losses on a lot of these players. Um, and and what we're seeing is the pre-COVID world and the post-COVID world. So you've got these signings. Yeah. Like Ndombele came in for 55 million. The Celso was 40 all in when you take the loan fee. And they were signed just before COVID. You're just going to have to accept. Sorry, lads, but you're not getting anything like that back. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's really interesting you you put that point. I mean, it's, you go to the other side of the uh, the bargaining. We've got Steven Bergwijn that's admitted he wants to leave Spurs this summer. And again, it, it does appear like a move to Ajax is on the cards, despite there seeming to be a haggling amongst that fee. Do we know how far we are down the line there, Charlie, with negotiations? Are we close to reaching an agreement with Ajax over that move? It feels like the player desperately wants to go. Yeah, something I reported last week which has been reiterated to me since, is that Spurs wanted to bring someone in before letting Bergwijn go. And so obviously that guy will hopefully be Richarlison, at which point you would think that will smooth the path for for Bergwijn to go to Ajax. The issue is over how much Ajax can pay. They're being pretty resolute. They're not going to go above 25 million euros, which is about 21.5 million pounds. Um... And it is complicated, you know, like with all these deals, there are various different things, um, sort of clauses and what have you, to, to make it satisfactory to both parties. He does want to go. He wants Champions League football there, and, and he gets to go to a great club. He gets to go home. But my understanding is that if that drags on and on and on, because it's already dragged on a while, then he would give consideration to other Premier League clubs. And it's not just Everton. There are others as well um, who are looking at him. But... Again, a, a bit like with Jed Spence, I do think that will happen, but that's been coming a long time. I mean, Ajax have wanted him for ages, and in January, they were really pushing for that. And they got slightly screwed by those two goals Bergwijn scored against Leicester <laughs> because all of a sudden... Bad PR stunt, wasn't it, really? Yeah, exactly. His value goes up. And for Spurs, that would have been a tricky sale to make at that point because I think a lot of Spurs fans would have said, hold on a minute, this guy's just gone and scored two late goals in one of the best moments we've had in recent years but um yeah event it looks like eventually they are going to get their man and and he's another one he's in the camp of a kind of sanchez player and that they're not they you know they weren't like we need to get rid of this guy it was more he's got a value um he's and he and he really wants to go he, you know he just wants to play football he's got again the world cup's coming up he, he needs games and he's just not getting them at spurs yeah Another very interesting kind of uh, situation as well. I think it was involving Christian Eriksen. Of course, there were reports last week that Spurs, they weren't going to follow up on their interest in the player. And of course, maybe a move to Manchester United or Brentford. So do you, what's your kind of understanding of, of why we're not, why Spurs aren't going for that? Because for me and a lot of other fans, I know, you know, they, they feel as though this probably is quite a good sign. You know, this could be a good sign of the Spurs because it allows us to change up. So, you know, why aren't we going for him? Yeah, I... I have to say, I found this one. This has been a strange one because we we had a Q and A with our uh, subscribers, and one of the questions, and this was this would have been coming up to two weeks ago now, and one of the questions was about Ericsson. and so you know we we were speaking to our contacts and trusted sources and all of that, and the noises we were hearing was that it was between Brentford and Spurs, and so we wrote that um, in in a you know fairly casual, this is what we're hearing sort of way in a Q and a rather than a big piece. Um, and then it all sort of went quiet. And then a couple of, a few days later, Spurs were saying, no, we're, we're not interested in him. So it's a strange one. And I, and I, you know, I, I don't fully know if that was them having a change of heart or maybe people had slightly misunderstood how interested they were. Um, but it's going to, you know, it's really interesting because, Brentford thought they were going to have an answer from Ericsson some time ago and still it drags on. I mean, you know, he, he the, the power's with him because he 
did so brilliantly for them um, in the second half of last season. But I'm really, really curious to see what happens next with that. Um, and, I, I, you know, I can see both sides of it from a Spurs perspective. I think, yes, obviously, there are tons of reasons it makes a load of sense. I can see why they might have thought, kind of, oh, you know, time to move on and we want a younger profile of player. But, you know, I, I was actually, I was unsure on that until being at the Brentford Spurs game in April and seeing him again up close and just being reminded of how phenomenal a player he is mm. and just his yep. his spatial awareness, his two-footedness. Like he was the best player on the park for either team by a distance. And that, again, that got me sort of believing again. But, yeah, it might just be after one, have to be one we... We let go of. Just want to ask you a quick follow-up question on that, Charlie, if you don't mind. I'm conscious of time. I know we've got five minutes or so. So um, just on this situation, Spurs find themselves in. Look, they've got an abundance of midfield talent now. Basuma, Skippy, Benton Corn. Now, obviously, um, of course, yeah, who have, who have I missed out there? Sorry, I'm, I'm now losing the note on Hoybier as well. It does feel like to me personally that we're still missing that creative midfielder, that lock picker, that person that can play that eye of the needle ball. We've seen the likes of, I think, Luis Paqueta, being mentioned as a potential Spurs target. I mean, you mentioned initially when you started off the show that that's not one of the key areas that they're focusing on right now. So do you think it's unlikely that Spurs would look to bring in a creative midfielder based I on think, those options yeah, at the moment? I think it's more if someone really irresistible for a good fee came about, then they'd move. But I guess someone like Liverpool's the model, aren't they? Because... They've managed to be incredibly successful without that kind of creative attacking midfielder. You know, Liverpool attack through their fullbacks and through an incredible front three. And I think that's more what Conte's teams have tended to do. I mean, yes, they've had Ericsson eventually came into the team at Inter, having been in peripheral for about a year. Fabregas had his moments at Chelsea. But really, when you think of those great Inter teams, you think of incredibly good attacking wing backs. Often they've had strike partnerships or in the case of Spurs, they've got that front three and often at Chelsea they had the front three as well. So I think he's shown that before in his career already. As I say, I think Liverpool have sort of demonstrated that. So I don't think it's a prerequisite and I do think it is more one where, yeah, if there was an opportunity, they'd move, but they'd feel pretty confident with A, the central midfielders they've got, B, the fact they're going to have four four very very good attackers to go into that front three plus Lucas Moura who'll be a kind of useful option as well and hopefully this season far more effective attacking wing backs because that's what's amazing that Spurs came forth did so well under Conte without the wing backs who he really wanted and that we so associate with his teams yeah absolutely the inquest is coming towards an end Charlie let's hand back <laughs> over to Jamie yeah, no, I thought that was an interesting one, especially comparing to Liverpool, because you're right, they don't really have that kind of creative midfielder and, and the wing-backs are that. And see with Perisic coming in, I think it's going to be such a good sign of the Spurs. Maybe that's where, you know, the creativity mm. will come from. But yeah, again, the fi- kind of the final question, we were wondering, how, obviously including Richarlison, how many more names do you reckon Spurs might be able to get through the door between now and uh, the end of the window? I, I think certainly two. I think certainly the right wing back and the left centre back on top of Richarlison, obviously. Um, and then, yeah, then it's more just about um, sort of opportunities. How, yeah, exactly. Being opportunistic. If if uh, the right opportunity comes available, then yeah, they can do it. But I think six was always the number I was told before, okay. and that I think that would be a really really efficient mm. window yeah. if they can get that done, uh, and especially having. You know, if Richardson goes through in the next few days, that'll be a minimum of four before South Korea. Maybe they can squeeze Spence in as well. That's yep. a really good window. Um, on top, on, off the back of a great season. Mm. Uh, there's only one name I think I forgot to ask you about, Charlie, because it's been on Spence's radar for a little bit of a while. It's Gleason Br- uh, Bremer, who I understand Bremer, is, yeah. not, is not left-footed, but he is a, a, a centre-back that seems to have got some interest from Spurs. Anything on him you can tell us? He's another one, yeah. And he, he had a brilliant season in Serie A last year. Um, they, they, do, they do like him. Um, so he, he's in that bracket, actually. He, he is a name I should have mentioned earlier. Kind of with Torres, Cavadiol Bastoni. It's, what I think will happen as well is that there are so, we're seeing it a little bit with the attackers as well, but there are a lot of good centre-backs that a lot of clubs are interested in and the dominoes need to start falling. Skriniar at Inter, another name that Spurs fans will be familiar with because Spurs were after him under Mourinho. Yep. Does he go to PSG? 
what are they, what do Inter do to replace him? You know, does that mean they don't need to make a sale in quite the same way with someone like Bastoni? So I think we kind of need the first domino to fall and then things will kind of fall into place a little bit more. Um, and it's just who, who moves first on all of those deals. Okay, interesting. And Charlie, I think the final one from me is, um, bear in mind, you started off the season interviewing Nuno <laughs> and, then we had Ali on, and we had Ali on here. So we know you didn't really get much from him in terms of content. I don't know how you did those press conferences. I don't know what you guys made of it at the end there thinking we've got four minutes worth. Uh, yeah. Nuno, it was a, uh, uh, well, just very quickly, Charlie, what was that like as an experience starting off with Nuno, ending with Conte? What was that like for you guys? Yeah, I mean, Nuno is fun. It's, it's, it's funny because for, for, for us at The Athletic, we're less reliant maybe on quotes um, than some others. Like we don't tend, to, we do some of it, but kind of on top of the longer form stuff, but kind of the, the those kind of press conference quotes. But when you are relying on it, I mean, it's just, you would ask him, what he would do is you'd ask him a question. So you'd say something like, Nuno, what did you make of Harry Kane's performance? And he'd say something like, but it's about all the performances. <laughs> It's about everyone and just wouldn't talk in specific. So we just give you this really general answer on like the team played well, which is obviously so boring. And, you, you know, you've asked about a specific player for a reason. And, you know, we were warned before, uh, you know, I spoke to colleagues who've covered Wolves and all this sort of thing and everyone, and they all said, yeah, you're, you're not going to get much out of him. But even with that warning, I was still a little bit surprised. And also because when he joined, what we were told was, yeah, that's what he was like before, but he knows, you know, he's at a big club, he needs to make more of an effort. I, I think he just doesn't enjoy the press conference format at all and thinks it's a bit stupid. And in some respects, he's right, but you kind of need to play the game a little bit. Um, and yeah. he just didn't. And I think had he done that, there'd have been more goodwill from the press. Whereas as it was, they're just, you know, it was hard to really warm to him because he wasn't, you know, you've kind of got to meet people halfway and he wasn't really doing that with us. And especially, you know, we come off the back of Mourinho who, love him or loathe him, was brilliant copy. You know, he would always give a great quote. Yeah. Pochettino was such a thoughtful, interesting person and very popular and very generous with his time. So it, it, was, it was a strange, strange period. Uh, you know, we go abroad for games and you'd just be like, what are we going to get from Nuno this time? Um, I was worried, Charlie, if you might even run out of an embargo section. It wouldn't be an embargo section. Yeah, there wouldn't be enough for it. <laughs> no, exactly. And then, and then obviously, yeah, Conte's come in and, and he's, uh, he's great. I mean, I love... I mean, Nuno, if you were being generous, you'd say he was unlucky as well because they were all on Zoom. We barely had a physical yeah. press conference. You know, I think one or two. Conte yeah. came in, coincided with press conference is becoming physical again and that yeah. does make an enormous difference you can build Absolutely. up that rapport yeah and Conte has a real charisma and a magnetism that you get way more in person um mm. but I've I mean yeah that that's been a, a huge shift you know from the difference in Nuno to Conte Con, Conte yeah. is really really good um you yeah, know he's very very interesting to speak to Conjure time, Charlie. Final question is, and a lot of people are saying, I mean, the fact that they, they, they listen to the view from the lane every week and they've heard you saying, how how was you so confident <laughs> that Spurs would finish fourth? I mean, they're asking last year's comments here. Please ask Charlie how confident, how was he so confident Spurs would get fourth? Is Charlie smug about the fact that he called it three months early that Spurs finished fourth? I mean, the question I've got for you is, what do you think Antonio Conte, not Spurs, not the fans, what do you think Conte's expectations are ahead of the new season? Is it about being close to Chelsea and Liverpool for him to truly believe that he can win a title at Tottenham? Yeah, I mean, well, starting with the yeah the first bit, um, yeah, the the one that I was the, the best one was after the Burnley defeat. I said I still think Spurs will get top four, and that the the abuse I got was was huge, and it was very funny then when they did get it, kind of being able to. You know, if I'd been a bigger person, I'd just let it go. But obviously, I was just like, this is amazing. If you're going to give me that much abuse, I'm obviously now going to gloat. So, yeah, that was, that was really satisfying. I mean, fundamentally, I just thought they... Uh, I just did think they were better than all their rivals. And a lot of it was Conte. I just had a lot of faith in him. I thought it was a bit of a, you know, having a gun in a knife fight compared to who was managing Arsenal. Obviously, Arteta's not very experienced. Ralph Rannick at United, they didn't seem to know what they were doing. So, I just thought... Yeah, I thought Conte gave them such a huge advantage. And then, yeah, to the second part of um, of that, yeah, I mean, I think he, Chelsea, he has Chelsea definitely in his sights. I mean, I think Spurs, 
they they were the third since he took over. Only City and Liverpool have picked up more Premier League points. Spurs were basically the third best team in the league under him last season. And he said it was really interesting actually. He said in March, having obviously they lost those three games to Chelsea without scoring in January. Then in March he said, "I'd love to play Spurs. I'd love to play Chelsea again because I don't think it would be it would pan out in quite the same way." And they get the chance to do that second game of the season. That game's so massive. You know how much have Spurs improved? Um, but yeah, he's got them, first of all, them in his sights. I think he wants to be right up there in third and then and then pushing on Liverpool and City. And let's not forget, Spurs picked up eight points against those two teams last season. Two wins, two draws. No one else came close to that. Um, so they've shown that on their day, they can match those teams. And then it's just about doing it over the course of the season, which is obviously a lot harder to do. But yeah, I think it. I think it's about... Be, being right up there with them he's not messing about you know he's not gonna he's not gonna be like yeah you know great we've made a bit of progress we're, we're coming third he is saying no I want to I want to believe that we can win titles you know yeah. that otherwise he wouldn't be here. he made that very clear last season when he kept saying that he wasn't used to fighting for the top four yeah Charlie it's been a pleasure having you thank you ever so much for your time Jay I'm sure you agree it's been brilliant having Charlie on I don't know like, where Spurs obviously are again flexing their muscles in the market or <laughs> looking like they are going to. Yeah, no, really interesting insight from Charlie. I thought that was a really interesting show. And again, you know, on an exciting evening with, with potentially Richarlis are coming in. So, uh, yeah, very, very good show. Amazing. Jay, we'll be keeping an eye, of course, on your feed for all the latest Tottenham Hotspur news. Charlie, finally, once again, where can people find the wonderful content you provide on our beloved football club? Oh, yeah. So, f- yeah, follow me on Twitter uh, at CD Eccleshare because I link to all the articles, all the podcasts there. Uh, yeah, so you'll find me writing on The Athletic and then podcasts like Football Clichés, View from the Lane, which is our Spurs pod. Sometimes I do the Totally Football Show with James Richardson. And as Ricky mentioned, got first book coming out in September and you can find link to that, uh, my pin tweet. So yeah, it's all there. And thanks very Amazing. much for having me. That was great. Charlie, it's been an absolute pleasure. Guys, over 13, 1400 of you watching us live. Thank you so much for all of your incredible support for last one on Spurs. Like Charlie over at View from the Lane. They'll be back very soon. We'll be back very soon. Keep safe, keep well. And as always, come on you Spurs. <laughs>